listening to Truth To You with Jono and G'day to Tamara in Nebraska. And uh, wherever you may be around the world, thank you for your company. It is time for Pearls from the Torah Portion with Keith Johnson and Nehemia Gordon. G'day, gentlemen. Good day. G'day, and this is a shout out to uh, Serena Sorenstein in uh, Longwood, Florida. Florida. There we go. And I'm giving a shout out yeah, to Andrew. For Andrew. Your back. G'day, Andrew. Where's Andrew? Andrew is my son. Hey! <laughs> And he's oh. a big fan, right? Yes, he is. Absolutely. He's awesome. Hey, G'day, Andrew. Andrew. Hey, listen. Now, before we do anything, I should tell you guys that we've had a complaint. Mm. Okay. Mm. All right. I'm going to tell you what and this is. That well, we're doing something right. <laughs> no, no, no. This is, this is from Linda and Phil. And, and, I, and I, I appreciate comments from, uh, from our listeners. And thank you, Linda and Phil, for your comment. They write, we have been listening since the beginning. And it seems to us the quality of the talk is degenerating into jokes and laughter too much. Please listen to your broadcast and hear yourselves. Quit with all the jokes and laughing and get back to the Bible and the Torah portion, which is the real reason why we are listening. I'm talking to you, Karai. So stop being so funny. This is a way to protect all of us from this issue of the jokes, and that's if we need to be wrapped in a Torah scroll. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's a and then nothing can touch us. We're protected. Uh, Keith, yes. Keith, quick. Yeah. Well, you know, I, one of the th- no, I think I, <laughs> one of the things that, uh, that 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 is happening is that you know we're 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 actually learning and growing as we're going, and, and it really is fun to be here. I mean, we got three different time zones, we've got three different people from three different backgrounds, trying to have commonality in the Word of God, and and the truth is is that. Um, Sometimes, uh, sometimes the only way that we can uh, deal with some of the things we deal with is, is to to laugh and to to be together. And hopefully, those people will understand we take seriously the word of God, but we also are human, and that we're we're trying to figure this out. And and I actually appreciate the fact that as we go along with this, we can bring some of our um, you know the human the human side of this into it. I mean, this certainly sure. isn't some dry opportunity. I mean, we're trying to have some fun while we're and I think the word of God is fun. And I'll be honest with you. So we'll we'll we'll, tr- we'll, we'll keep trying to do what we're doing and, and make sure that people can hear what we're hearing and, and get the revelation. But I mean, I don't want to tell Nehemiah, hey Nehemiah, um, go back to the way you were ten years ago, where I couldn't get a crack and smile out of him. I mean, Look, I'd rather. I mean, have- here's the thing: yeah. if, if they're not if they're not happy with my jokes, they're entitled to a full refund. There you go. That's true. <laughs> I, I I should put that on the website. <laughs> if you're not happy, we will give you your money back. Absolutely. Yeah. But you know what? Listen, let you know we are we are coming to this uh, with integrity and excitement and joy and happiness, and uh, it, it's mm. a big deal for us. It's fun. It's fun for me to be talking to you, Jono and Nehemia. I mean, it really is hilarious. That it's midnight for you and two o'clock for Nehemia and seven o'clock for me. People should know. Sometimes you know the phone rings and I'm like, oh, what, what, what time is it? And, and sometimes Nehemia <laughs> hadn't had his coffee or had three three cups of it. So I mean. <laughs> Well, that's good. Now, see, now, Keith, you are, I, I just got to say, you are great at damage control. You're the man. It's not damage control. It's, it, no, it is. No, come on. I mean, obviously, this is, I, I would go so far as to say that this is a skill that you have developed just from having this relationship with Nehemia, right? <laughs> I wouldn't say. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's refined. He's refined you. In, I no, no, no. That's... He's refined me, yes. Yeah. No, I, I think I, want, I do want to say something though. I think I think it really, you know, I asked a question, uh, Jono, and and I've, I've I told Nehemia I've been asking this question. I've asked a question in the last uh, few weeks uh, from a number of different people. Mm-hmm. I say, tell me um, where there is a, a Jew and Gentile working together, where the common ground truly is the Word of God, and it's not about conversion, and it's not about um, you know some peace initiative, or it's not about some uh, fundraising thing, but actually where Jew and Gentile come together on the word of mm-hmm. God. And, 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 and they couldn't tell me of anywhere where that was happening. And I, except for what's happening here on Truth to You and uh, Pearls from the Torah, where in integrity, we are taking on a really holy and important topic, uh, mm. which is the Bible. Amen. But at the same time, what people should get excited about is we're doing this in a way where we're not saying, Nehemiah, uh, you know, you can only say this, Keith. You can only say that, mm. Jonah. You can only say this, and we're bringing who we are as people to this. That's what yes. I think is so cool about it. So, to me, let the, let let the fun continue. <laughs> let the fun continue. But I do. Oh, we, we agree. Also, we do agree with Linda and Phil that that I mean, obviously, the Word of God is a serious to be taken seriously, and yes. we do endeavor to take it seriously. Yes, and mm-hmm. uh, it's probably good every now and then to be kept in check. But uh, so what I'm going to do, we've already gone from being rated M to rated PG. Now I'm going to move us from the comedy section to the historical documentary section. Mm-hmm. How's that? Okay. All right. Okay. That's where we're going on the shelf. Today uh, I we are. That. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Today we, 
<laughs> You'll have to speak to the censor board, I think. Okay. Today we are oh. in <laughs> Vayachel, uh, Exodus 35, verse 1 to 38, 20. And it begins like this. It, be it begins like this. Then uh, Moses gathered all the congregation of Israel, children of Israel together, and said to them, These are the words which Jehovah has commanded you to do. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh day shall be a holy day for you, a Sabbath rest to Jehovah. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death, full stop. But then, in verse 3, you shall kindle no fire throughout your dwellings on the Sabbath day. Now, I know we've touched on this briefly. Actually, Yoel, Ben Shlomo, and myself, we've, we've actually discussed this a couple of times in a little bit more depth uh, in recent conversation. But do you guys have anything to add to this? this is verse 3 of 35. I know for myself, uh, this has been, this is a verse uh, that, you know, it's really wonderful when we do go through these portions. As we read them, there are certain things that jump off the page as far as remembering. And I remember um, having this conversation with Nehemiah, because for me as a Methodist, coming to the Tanakh, uh, I kind of saw the Sabbath as something that was for the Jews, and, you know, it's nice that they have that, but, they, you know, eventually they'll come to the, to the light of the knowledge that Sunday is the real day. And, um, and that was always my, that was sort of my thought. And as uh, from a, a rereading of the Tanakh and understanding sort of the significance of the Sabbath itself as a, as a theme that runs throughout the entire, and all of the Tanakh, even into the New Testament, uh, it made me slow down and ask a simple question. So what does it mean to actually honor the Sabbath? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that came up, and I remember having this conversation with Nehemiah Great Depth regarding this idea of fire on the Sabbath. Was it the fire because of the work that you had to uh, go through thinking this in my mind. It's the work. You're out. You're dealing with g gathering wood. Until we did what he loved to do with me is to go word by word and idea by idea and concept by concept, what did the word work mean? Well, work mean. And, and then that's when the light came on again. And I said, okay, so is, what is this issue of fire? And I, I mean, I've, Nehemi, you probably remember this conversation. And I think you did a mm -hmm. phenomenal job of basically you know, like, like what I say is taking, the, taking it apart and putting it back together again. You know, it's like taking, you know, having a toy and saying, hey, how does this toy work? Well, let's take it apart. Oh, but the toy's broken. Yeah, but we're going to put it back together again. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the Sabbath and the issue of the fire was that kind of thing for me. So, um, you know, I think it's important to know that we're talking about, when he's talking about the Sabbath here, he's, he's talking about something, as I mentioned, that's been consistent as a, as a theme throughout. But then when he specifically says, do not light a fire in any of your dwellings on the Sabbath day, people mm -hmm. have interpreted that to mean so many different things that um, this, this could be one of those things if we take, took a moment and I asked Nehemiah, in your tradition, what did it mean not to light a, a fire? And did that include then in modern times electricity? Mm -hmm. That would be a question that I would ask. And so really, you know, it says don't kindle or don't light a fire. Actually, even uh, translating it, don't light a fire is already... Um, gravitating towards one of the uh, uh, interpretations, mm -hmm. um, which I guess you have to do. Um, so this has been interpreted uh, in, in quite a number of different ways. And in fact, there's a, there's a very common Jewish tradition that has its source in this verse as a way of forcing people into one particular interpretation of this verse. And that tradition is specifically lighting the Sabbath candles on Friday afternoon just before sunset. And, when, uh, and this is a rabbinical tradition. And when they uh, light the Sabbath candles, they say, uh, Bless out thy Lord, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments, uh, commanding us to light, this, uh, the, the, to light the Sabbath candle. So basically they're saying that God has commanded us to light the Sabbath candle, and everyone knows that God didn't actually command us to light the Sabbath candles. In fact, that's a rabbinical uh, commandment, uh, mm -hmm. a, a, a rule that actually the rabbis made up, what they call takanot. It's a, uh, an injunction that the rabbis, um, <clears throat> that they uh, foisted upon the people, and, the, and they actually only did this around the uh, uh, ninth or 10th century. And the context of this, of, of this particular uh, one of the Takanot was that there was a debate between uh, the rab rabbinical Jews and the Karite Jews, specifically over this verse. And the predominant view of, of the Karite Jews at the time was that not only does this mean uh, not to start a fire, and not only is it not to start and feed a fire, you shouldn't start a fire, feed a fire, or even have a fire. Hmm. And they actually translated this verse as, you shall not cause a fire to burn in all your habitations on the Sabbath day, mm -hmm. which is a possible uh, tra translation from the Hebrew, meaning you could legitimately translate it that way. And there's actually, I believe, the um, Everett Fox edition, which is one of the translations of the of the Torah, 
uh, a rabbinical translation actually it actually translates this as you shall not call, you shall not burn a fire in all your habitations on the Sabbath day. Well, which one is it? Those are three three different interpretations. The actual act of initially starting the fire, the act of initiating it, and then also feeding it, maintaining it. Those are two mm-hmm. different things, right? And the third mm-hmm. one is starting it, feeding it, that is maintaining it, and even leaving it from beforehand. So the rabbis stepped in and they said, you know, a lot of our people are are gravitating towards this karite position. Um, we're we're gonna we're gonna tip the scales by requiring people to light a fire on Friday afternoon and leave it burning into the Sabbath, and we're gonna make them proclaim that God has given us the authority to do this. And when they say, you know, God has sanctified us with his commandments concerning the Sabbath candle, everyone understood that that was actually God supposedly giving the rabbis authority to create new commandments. Um, and so this thing has, you know, continued until this day. Now, what I see many Karite Jews from my camp doing is they is they get very reactionary. They say, well, if the rabbis are lighting the Sabbath candles because uh, they knew that it was forbidden based on the Karite interpretation, then we're going to stick to that interpretation and not even listen to what the other possibilities are. And, and I think that's a mistake. I, I think uh, um, what re- we really should do is say, here are all the possibilities. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to be... Um, you know, uh, uh, pushed into one box or another box. You can appreciate that, Keith. I don't want to be pushed into one box or another box just because some group did something a thousand years ago. What does that have to do with me? Mm-hmm. I want to understand the Word of God uh, as it was intended. Now, how do we do that? That's not so easy. So, and I remember I said that that, that was the predominant uh, position of the Karaites uh, a thousand yes. years ago. There are actually other positions, and really, all three of those positions um, that I mentioned: starting the fire, starting and feeding, starting feeding and having. You can find that those in different among different Karaites. And then, for example, one Karaite um, about 100 years ago, he, he pointed out, he said, look, I mean, today we could just press a button. And how can you tell me that that's work on the Sabbath, pressing a button to start a fire? In the old days, what they would do is they take two pieces of flint or they pick actually a piece of iron and flint and they and they make sparks. And it was a whole process of building a fire. Mm-hmm. Today, where you press a button and, for example, turn on your car. Now you say, well, what does a car have to do with fire? Car has an internal combustion engine. Mm-hmm. Every time you step on the gas, you are um, you are feeding fire to the car. When you uh, turn it on initially, you're actually starting a fire. Mm-hmm. So, what, for example, Orthodox Jews won't use a car on Shabbat, and most Karat Jews uh, that I know won't use a, uh, a car on Shabbat. And the question really is, and I'm not going to answer this for the people, because my motto as a Karat Jew is search well in the Scripture and, and don't rely blindly on anyone's opinion. Amen. Um, you know, work it out for yourselves. But really, you have to ask the question, what is this commandment about? If the commandment's about work, about labor— then it does have to do with the labor involved in starting it. The the counter argument to that is, well, it doesn't say the word labor in verse 3. Labor is mentioned in verse 2. Okay, mm-hmm. so you could argue that. Um, so there's all these considerations out there, and um, you know, it, it, I think it's something that people have to stop and say, okay, I need to study this and uh, ask for God, uh, ask God to give me guidance, to open my eyes. And, and I think actually maybe this is a good time for Keith to say our weekly prayer. Hey, there it is. <laughs> Psalm 119, <laughs> verse 18, and Keith's going to say it. He's <laughs> just put you always, in. This is always what Nehemiah does. Well, let me just <laughs> let, let me say this. I'm actually appreciating this. Uh, I happen to be in a situation now where, where uh, it, it, like I mentioned to you, um, you and Jono earlier, um, one of the things that it feels to me like when we get to the Tanakh, it's a chance to, to hide a little bit uh, in, in, in the Word of God. And, and while we're in the Word of God, we get such an amazing perspective. So uh, let me just say this prayer for all those that are simply uh, um, needing this. Father, we want to thank you for this chance to be uh, on this uh, communication ability. We're able to communicate around the world. And right now as we are in the Word of God, we ask that you would open our eyes, that we might see the wonderful things that are hidden in your Torah, including the things that we don't understand. And so in this situation, we thank you in advance that in the end, we will uh, be have drawn closer to you by by simply approaching the, the scripture with integrity and asking, what does it mean for us now? In your name, amen. 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 So one of the things I want to say, uh, Jono and, and Hemia, regarding this verse, is it was a, a bit of a rabbit hole a little bit, because what I wanted to ask was, so what would be the significance of fire beyond the the idea of, of lighting it? And so from a practical mm-hmm. standpoint, I wanted to ask I wanted to ask a question. Uh, when I was over in Israel, um, I would see people have this whole idea of um, lights on and lights off. So, so uh, if you turn the light on, uh, one friend of mine said, well, if I turn the light on before Shabbat and I don't turn it off, then I can keep the light on, but I believe that the light is fire or something like that. 
So my question to actually him that is, doesn't have to do with fire. That has to do with something else. But that has to do with something <clears> else. Most, most Jews most Jews don't connect uh, electricity to fire. They're actually two okay. different forces. Mm-hmm. Uh, so 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 I don't really think I don't that doesn't have to do with fire. That has the concept that you know when when electricity electrical lights especially came in, into vogue, you know the rabbinical authorities. If you, it, or the people who call themselves rabbinical authorities, ask the question, you know, is this something that we want to be doing on Shabbat, turning on and off lights? And for a variety of reasons, they decided uh, if you leave it on from before the Sabbath, you can have it on, but you can't turn it on and off. Um, and if you leave it on, you've got to leave it on. If you leave it off, you've got to leave it off. And then, and then there'll be like ridiculous situations that happen. I remember growing up, you'd be, everyone would be, you know, on Friday night in the in, in, you know, at the Shabbat table, and uh, there would, you know, the, the circuit breaker would jump, and you would, uh, or actually back then, <laughs> I'm that old, uh, the fuse would blow. <laughs> yeah, I remember back that. Back when there were actually physical fuses. And, um, and you know, I grew up Orthodox, so the, the belief was that we got to wait until after Shabbat to fix it. So we'd be sitting there as Orthodox Jews, sitting in the dark on a Friday night um, without light, without any electricity. Um, the food um, in the refrigerator and the freezer going bad, uh, and, uh, and that's just how it was. And then I had friends growing up who would say, well, that's caused by demons. That demons come and destroy the circuit so that you'll suffer on Shabbat, which you know, I thought was utterly ridiculous, but, but who knows, right? Um, so anyway, so that actually doesn't have to do necessarily with fire. or They don't connect it to fire directly. Um, the issue with fire really uh, uh, plays out in, when it comes to you know, something like a car. So if a car... Uh, a car does produce electricity, and so if you take this to mean that you're not allowed to uh, uh, start a fire or feed a fire, and it has nothing to do with the labor involved, then um, then you can't use a car on Shabbat. Now, why would there be a commandment like that? That's the question you're asking, and the truth is we can ask that for a lot of commandments. Like, the, you know, there's the commandment about, you know, not um, mixing wool and linen, so what's the reason for that commandment? Or, you know, the classic example they ask is, you know, why do we, uh, for purification from the dead, why do they bring a red heifer? Why isn't it a black heifer or a blue heifer, mm-hmm. right? And so the tendency in, in the Jewish tradition is to say, well, it's, you know, kacha, it's just mm-hmm. an arbitrary thing. Or maybe it's not arbitrary, but we don't know because God didn't tell us. Um, and really how you keep this commandment has to do with how you, how you understand that. I mean, if you say, well, this is about labor then that already will influence how you keep this commandment. If you say, well, it's just some arbitrary thing, and, and you know, I don't know why, or some people will say, as well, you know, everything in the universe that, that um, it has to do with creation is connected to fire. You know, the first thing God said was, let there be light, and that presumably may have, or was assumed, the people who said this assumed that that had something to do with fire, and so fire is creation, and we shouldn't have to do with creation. So there's all kinds of different opinions out there about what exactly this means, and, and, what, and what, therefore what the application is. And, you know, I, I was thinking about this recently, you know, and there was this, there was this movement like almost 2,000 years ago called the Gnostics, and they believed that you had to have a certain knowledge in order to get salvation. And if you didn't have that exact secret knowledge, then you were going to you know, burn in the fires of hell forever, um, except for maybe not on Shabbat because there's no fire, right? That was a joke. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm, he's not laughing. What's going on here? Oh, no, no, uh, no, no, he's no, he's 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 he said we're not going to be funny. What are you talking about? Okay, go ahead. Okay, well, you said you're not going to be funny. <laughs> I, I can't okay, 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 Anyway, okay. so... Uh, <laughs> So, so I don't think this is about gnosis, about um, about having secret knowledge. I Meaning, I don't think you need to interpret this the correct way in order to be right with God. From my, the way I look at it, look, when the Messiah comes, he'll tell us what the true interpretation is. Mm-hmm. Can I give um, but a, until then, I think what we have to do. Let me just finish. I'm almost done. What we have to do until then is do the best that we can. And and I believe that the process of going through that, of saying, God, give me guidance and and help me understand how to keep this commandment. And even if you get it wrong, you've done your best. I mm-hmm. think that is that is uh, that is having the relationship with God as opposed to you know getting up and just saying okay well this is what my you know people told me to do so I'm going to follow that well then you're following the commandment of men not the okay. commandment of God even mm-hmm. if they happen to have the right secret knowledge that's not your you having a relationship you with need God to so own I think it for yourself. That you need to own it for yourself I think that's more important than uh, happen to you know if you happen to get the right interpretation I'll give you from my own experience I've actually run the entire gamut on this verse throughout my years, there was a time when I used on Shabbat, no, uh, ba- basically I sat throughout the entire Shabbat without any electricity and any uh, lights and, and basically had nothing on Shabbat because I, I was thinking not so much that fire, it's, I won't go into a whole complicated thing. Basically, I've looked at all the different understandings of this and throughout my years, ha- I feel like I've grown and evolved and maybe some people would think I devolved. 
Um, but I think it's more important that I have that relationship with God than that I uh, stick to a tradition that I that I have mm. come to believe is wrong. And there, I'll let Keith mm-hmm. talk. I've got nothing more yeah. to say. Okay. Yeah. Well, no, all I was going to say is um, that one of the things that I've decided to do here in our household is just the idea of – I took the idea of dwelling where I live and, and uh, the, the idea of whether I would be um, lighting a fire, not, not whether I'd have lights on and have circuits on or those kinds of things. But basically the overall writing idea that I've taken is what does it mean for my house to rest? What does it mean for me to take a time that's different? during that 24 hour period of time that's not like the other six days. And so, mm-hmm. you know, I, you know, and this is another discussion, you know, I tell the oven, Hey, oven rest. And, 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 uh, you know, uh, <laughs> other things, let's, let's all, let's all rest together and, uh, just have an enjoyable time uh, during Shabbat. And it makes that day different than any other day without making judgment about anyone else and how the details of it works out. I just don't light a fire. <laughs> it's as simple as that sure. for me. So anyway. Um, yeah, no, that's good. I'm glad we touched on that. And Moses spoke to all the congregation of Israel and the children of Israel saying, this is the thing which Jehovah commanded saying, take from among you an offering to Yehovah, whoever is willing of heart, of a willing heart, let him bring it as an offering to Yehovah, gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple, scarlet, thread, fine linen, goat's hair, ram skin, dyed red, badger skin. Now, I think we touched on this, didn't we? Yeah, we talked about that. We Tosh. talked about that one. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, and uh, acacia wood, oil for the light, the spices of anointing oil, sweet incense, onyx stones, stones, and set in, uh, in the effort in the breastplates. Now, a lot of this stuff, i just let everybody know, there's a lot of repetition and stuff that we have actually covered, but uh, I do want to point something out here. It goes on about the, the anointing oil and the, the hangings and the sockets and the pillars and the garments and so on and so forth. But it talk, Keith, it talks about the offering, and I'm particularly interested in the offering because something very interesting happens here. All the congregation of, of uh, the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses. Then everyone came whose heart was stirred and everyone whose spirit was willing. And they brought Yehovah offering for the work of the tabernacle of meeting, for its service and for its holy garments. They came, both men and women, as many as had a willing heart. And they brought their earrings and nose rings, the rings, the necklaces, the jewelry of gold, that every man who, uh, every man who made an offering of gold Yehovah, and every man uh, with whom was found blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine linen. And basically, they, they brought it all, and they were very, very willing. And uh, it's interesting, in verse 26, it says, And the women whose hearts stirred with, the, with, with wisdom, hearts stirred with wisdom, spun yarn of goat's hair, and the rulers brought onyx stones and, and, and all of this stuff. And then all of a sudden, we read in verse 29, the children of Israel brought a free will offering to Yehovah, and uh, all the men and women whose hearts were willing to bring material for all kinds of work, which Yehovah, by the hand of Moses, had commanded to be done. So the call went out. They said, this is what we need. Uh, those of you whose hearts are stirred to give, those of you who are willing, please come forward and give a free will offering to Yehovah for the for the service of the temple, the materials for the temple, and there was an overwhelming response. I think that was a very interesting translation. Um, like in verse 21, you, you read it something like, you know, his heart was stirred or something like that. But what it actually says, uh, how, did, how did you translate that uh, in verse guess, 21? In verse 21, then everyone came whose heart was stirred and everyone whose spirit yeah. was willing, and they brought Yehovah offering okay. for the... Uh, so what it, said, what it says in Hebrew... Is and they came. Every man whose heart lifted him up, hmm. and and all and everyone who uh, his spirit ca- um, and this is funny to translate. His spirit caused him to give freely. So mm-hmm. here, uh, the, it's not uh, being, it, what it literally says in the Hebrew isn't passive. It's actually an action that his heart lifted him up, and his spirit caused him to give freely. And uh, and then later in. Um, in verse 26, it says, and all the women who uh, their hearts or their heart uh, lifted them up with wisdom. And mm-hmm. then again, verse 29, every man and woman who uh, their heart uh, caused them to give freely. So it's really interesting that the heart in the and the and the spirit is described as doing this in the Hebrew. In the English, it's it's translated into passive action. It, it just happens somehow. Yeah, that so is, I think that, that's interesting. It's fascinating. Verse 31 says, yeah. uh, and it's talking of, actually, I'll start from 30. Moses said to the children of Israel, See, Yehovah has called by name, uh, Be'azel, 
It's Al. Uh, Bisael. So, so the we son of Uri. About him for a second. Bisael. Um, you know, Hebrew names are short sentences uh, very often, and uh, and Bisael, his name, uh, you, you could actually translate it a couple different ways, and, and this is one of, I suppose, the embarrassing things. We don't always know what the re- reason for the name is. Like take a name like Aaron. We don't actually mm-hmm. know for sure what that name means. Uh, Bitsalel, there's actually two big possibilities. One is that it's from the two words Batsal and El, which means the onion of God. <laughs> the, the what? Um, the, what? <laughs> the onion the of God? Onion, is that what you said? The onion of God, right. And the onions they had back then were, were probably more like scallions because uh, th- those are the ones that are indigenous to this region. Um, so the scallion of God. Hmm. I mean, and that's a possibility that that was simply what his name meant and for whatever reason. Um, and uh, the other possibility is that his name means in the shadow of God. That's the other possibility. It's L. Okay, um, like in the shadow. Yeah. I like Although both the of truth them. I is like that... You like both uh, of them? I like the both onion of them. God? And I'll tell you why. Well, in the shadow? Of all, well, no, I want to back, back up one second. So one of the things that's always a really a, a big tension, and, and it, really is, it really is a tension regarding this whole issue of ministry and money. And this idea, when I read this story, how powerful it is that there was a vision and then there was the provision. But what happened was for the provision to meet the vision, there had to be something internal to the people. Something had to happen. Mm-hmm. And I think that humanly, um, short of something happening, you know, it's always sort of like, well, what's the least amount I can do and get away with it? And what's so powerful about this particular story and what gives me great hope is that when he had determined, when the father determined that, okay, we're going we're gonna to bring forth this, this, uh, this amazing um, place where I'm going to come and dwell and speak and it's going to be a picture of, uh, of my, my presence on, on earth, <clears throat> he could have, um, if I can say this, he could have snapped his fingers and had something fall from heaven and there it was. Mm-hmm. But instead what happened is um, the people's spirits were stirred they 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 came willingly and it's interesting moses didn't stand up and say okay now who will give the 50 who will give the 100 who will give the 1000 how can i play the right music how can i give you the right message what video how can, can i, I get play the lighting just right and the music I, just yeah, right but what to I, stir but, you to... but what i want to say about this that I, that i want to say and i guess i'm i've come to this place as a result of reading this is i'm, not, I'm no longer afraid to address this issue because of the nonsense that takes place regarding resources. Mm -hmm. When there is a vision that people believe in, what I always pray for is that they would have the experience like they had back then, that their hearts would be stirred, that their minds would be moved, whether Mm -hmm. they're stirred in the night or in the day or whatever that says, you know what, this is important. I'll give you an example. And I'm going to just use you as an example, Jonah. Um, You know, you'll, you'll say at the end of the program, you'll say, and if this program has helped you, please consider donating. You know, you never talk about it. Uh, too much. But you know what? One of the things that I pray is that people would be stirred and they would be moved and they would say, hey, Jonah, this is an amazing thing that you're doing there. How can we help you? How can we support you? And those people out there that do have something, learn some information, get some inspiration, get some revelation. I don't mind saying today where I wouldn't have said it last year, but I will say it today. There is a place in our lives where, where when he moves us, to bring provision around a vision that we should have joy and excitement about it takes mm-hmm. no manipulation but sometimes people don't even know the need and and I want to tell you that I'm appreciating now that we can begin to say here's what the vision is here's what we're gonna do and if you're stirred we'd love for you to be a part of it but here's the difference you bring it we're not gonna receive it you bring it you 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 feel you feel led to bring it we're not gonna manipulate call and make you feel guilty for not mm-hmm. that's between you and God so I wanted to say that it's it's powerful now about my friend who has the two different meanings of the name, let me be a, a preacher for a second. I'm thinking, well, if he's the onion of God, God had to peel him and make the people weep. And then the, more, the deeper he got <laughs> to the core of who he was, the people began to it's weep. Joke, and that's what the onion was. No, I'm not joking. I mean, listen, well, that that, you know, whether it's the, is, is the shadow of God, is the, you know, the reflection. is you know, there, There's so many powerful things. And like sometimes, you guys, what I do when I do study the Tanakh, I literally have to get up from my table and walk away mm-hmm. because it. of the depth that because of the depth that could be there and the depth that is there. So I, I like both options. <laughs> so I'm putting a tick against both of your names for being funny. There no, 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 no. no. And, and going, going back to the issue of what you said, Keith, about how, you know, I guess, especially in your tradition, there's this idea of, um, of getting the music just right and the lighting just right. And, and 
what, you, what they're trying to do is they're trying to stir people's hearts. And what it says, and maybe that's the significance of it in verse 21, yeah. where it says, and, and, and they came, every man whose his heart stirred him and, every, and everyone who his spirit caused him to give freely. So rather mm -hmm. than this being an outside force, this was something that came from within them ah, and stirred them Amen. and lifted them up. Amen. To so it wasn't, a, it wasn't a matter of being manipulated or influenced into a particular emotion. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, let me tell you from my experience, uh, mm -hmm. for, for many, many years, I was a, a guitarist in what was called the ministry team, the music ministry team. And that's specifically what we aim to do. I don't mind telling you. We, we arranged uh, the order of songs to uh, progress in a particular direction emotionally. I mean, I'll tell you, I, one of my favorite uh, bands uh, when I was younger was Pink Floyd because I loved the way that they could manipulate the crowd with emotion. And I just found that to be such a powerful thing. And we used to do that in church. We would, um, we would you know, play in, in a certain way and, and uh, manipulate the song even to bring about emotion. And people would love to get wrapped up in it. And then that's called that the Holy Spirit. It was just the way we worked and it worked. And that's why we did it. And uh, so, you know, I, it's chapters like this that I really do appreciate that Yehovah says, hey, free will offering, if, if you are stirred, by all means, pre bring it, this is what we need to do. And the people were stirred. And as, as Nehemiah, as you say, their hearts lifted them up and their spirit mm -hmm. uh, moved them to, and, and they gave so much, and I want to come back to this in just a minute, but they gave so much that we read over in verse 6 of uh, chapter 36, that it says, in fact, let me go back to uh, verse 5. It says, uh, and they spoke to Moses saying, this is the, the, the workers, that would, these are the people, the, the, the artists and the, the trade, trained uh, workers, the craftsmen. They said, the people bring much more than enough, much more than enough. Not just they've brought enough. It's not just they've brought more than enough. They've brought much more than enough for the service of the work which Jehovah commanded us to do. So Moses gave a commandment, Keith, he gave a commandment, uh, and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp, saying, neither, let neither man nor woman do any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. And the people were restrained from bringing for the material that they uh, had was sufficient for all the work to be done, indeed, too much. Now, you know, uh, these days, if something like that happened, you know they, they'd be saying, "Moses, you could have had a private, you could have a private jet. You don't have a private jet. You need to get a private jet. You could have done it. You don't tell them to stop breathing. You, have, you know, keep it on." You mean they you don't? don't they on. don't do that in a lot of a lot of tr in, in your guys' tradition that where they tell people, "Look, we we built the building. We don't need any more money. We have the you know the money to pay for it and everything. Stop, stop breathing." They, they don't do that. Is what you're telling me? They, well, I, I want to say this. I want to say this. One, one of the things that's hard about this, this, this particular concept for me anyway, is that there's work to be done, and 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 I mean, when there's work to be done, you'd love to be able to have that problem. The problem that I have is that as I do go to different places and I do see different things, and whether I turn on the television or whether it's the radio or whether I'm reading the newspaper or just simply traveling, and I'm I'm on my way to go and share. With Nehemia on you know some some concept that we're dealing with, it's a biblical concept, and we drive by ten churches that you know have twenty thousand square feet and uh, you know all these buildings, and I think to myself, so what is the actual work that's being done, and when do you have enough for the work versus when do you have enough to meet all the other desires and wants? What's the work versus the want, you know, and the, or, the, or the desire? And and to be honest with you, I don't I don't know, for example. Some of the places that I've been, I don't know if it's necessary to have, you know, um, gold-plated, uh, um, you know, toilet handles uh, versus, what you know, you people mean? not the, having, the, having, and having, 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 you want to touch no, no, grass? No. What's wrong with no, you? No, no, no. <laughs> what I'm saying is what, 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 when the need may be right around the corner for people, you know, widows and orphans and people that need food or people, you know, we live in a society right now, right. at least over where I live. Where there are there are a lot of people that are just struggling to make the the minutia the small things ha ha happen, mm -hmm. so one of the things when I read this and I appreciate you taking the time and slowing down on it is enough for the work versus enough for what I want and I mm -hmm. believe there's a lot of work that's to be done and that I'm I'm still praying that people's hearts are stirred and their and and their minds are disturbed are, are stirred to say what is the work and how can we support it so. Mm -hmm. I want to Amen. tell you, I appreciate, I appreciate us slowing down about that. Amen. So I'm just going to step back. Moses said to the children, this is verse 30, Moses said to the children of Israel, See, Yehovah has called by name Onion Boy 
and yes. the son of Uri, the son of, sorry, I just made a joke, check against my name. Son of Uri, son of Hur, uh, of the tribe of Judah. Now, here it is. And he has filled him with the spirit of God in the wisdom and understanding and knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to uh, design artistic works, to work. In, now, this is something that we read actually over and over again, that Yehovah, and we've commented on this before, but right. uh, that he, he fills them with, a, with, with his spirit to have uh, the knowledge, the wisdom, the understanding, and, uh, and it says 32, to design artistic works, to work in gold and silver and bronze, in cutting jewels for setting and carving wood, and to work in all manner of artistic uh, workmanship, verse 34. And he has put in his heart the ability to teach. So it's not only, not only does, does Yehovah give them the wisdom, the knowledge, the understanding, the artistic design, uh, and, um, the ability to work in this way, but also the ability to teach. Now, I want to stop and stand back and just jump off this for a second because I would say that Yehovah has put into you guys the ability to teach. How does it feel? Tell us about it. No, I... <laughs> Well, let me I'm say serious. this. Don't, I'm don't absolutely, no, I'm but, absolutely but, serious because here, here, no, no, because here we, here we are. Well, with, I give uh, credit to Yehovah for everything I do right and take credit for everything I do uh, wrong <laughs> for myself. <laughs> no, and, and I do believe he has put in me the, in, uh, in my heart the, the, this ability to teach. And, and I, I think that's, a, that's an amazing gift that I cherish and, and am aware of it. And I don't think mm-hmm. it's because I'm really smart uh, or, you know, or that it's because Keith has, you know, this. Uh, natural talent. I think in both cases, it's it's that God has given us these abilities. I really do. So, thank you, God. I I, I, mean, look, I agree because ability. I mean, let me just remind the listeners. I know I know most of them know. Talking about Nehemiah, you know, um, the Hebrew verse, the Greek Jesus, an book, valuable book. Everybody should have it on their shelf. Um, you you both wrote a prayer to our Father again. I cannot recommend it highly enough. Keith, his hallowed name revealed again, and the DVD, the teaching DVDs that go along with these books. Right. Uh, right. They're mm-hmm. they're they're so essential, you know, for the and. And and Nehemiah, your your new book, which is so close to be to being put out there, and I, I, I can't tell the listeners fact, by the how time this brilliant is broadcast, it is. It may already be out there. All right, <laughs> Maybe, that's right. Yeah, may, yeah. may it may it be. Well, I, I will say something. Uh, and I, one of the things that is is interesting about this is the idea being that the Spirit of God uh, has given this ability to these folks to do His purposes, and whether that be teaching. Jono, I, and I, I don't mind saying this, you know, we've been on, uh, I don't know how many different radio shows, how many different places where we've been on, and there's no offense to anyone else we've ever spoken to, but you do a p- phenomenal job of being able to really bring do. the best out of people that you interview, and, and that, that's a gift. And I think all of this, you know, you say, how does it feel? I could say, well, how does it feel to you? I, I mean, how does it feel that you're being used to to help people understand the Torah uh, by by providing this opportunity for us to come in and to work with you and to bring the best out of what we have, it's a very natural experience, you know, to to be here. But I think all of it still focuses on one thing: the vision is X. The provision is he's got his people and his opportunities and the everything we need to do what he wants us to do. We have the question mm-hmm. is: do we access it? You know, is it is it inconvenient? Is it are we afraid? I mean, there's all sorts of things that would maybe keep people from not doing it. But we want to keep doing what he's calling us to do. Uh, and being a part of the, his work here and amongst us. I mean, that's what's so powerful. Mm. And I want to I ask, but I do want to ask a question, and I think maybe people should ask this. I almost feel like I'm just deja vu as we're going through this section because it was just a few uh, chapters earlier where we were talking about, and I think it is in chapter 31, if I'm right, you guys can let me know. Yeah, in chapter 31, uh, we were dealing with this, and in chapter 31, it was talking about the Sabbath. And then we had mm-hmm. this little interruption of the golden calf, and then yes. we went back to this again. So my mm-hmm. question is, is simply this. If you're reading this, and it, does it not feel deja vu to you all? You're, you're reading this about oh, these yeah. men. You're reading about this. And, and what would be the purpose for this being repeated? Now, I have some thoughts, but I'd like to hear yours, Jono and Nehemia. And maybe others are asking the same question. What, what, we just went through this. Am I, am I listening to the same program? Right. And not only is it repeated, it's repeating an ex- repeated in excruciating detail, especially mm-hmm. as we get into the la- uh, later chapters of this portion. Where you know it talks about, I mean, take for example the opening verses of chapter 37. I mean, it's almost word for, where, where it says, "And Betzal made the ark, uh, etc." And, and it mm-hmm. gives the dimensions mm-hmm. of the ark, and it's almost word for word of the commandment where it was mm-hmm. given in an earlier chapter. And what it could have done is just said, "And Betzal made the ark according to what Moses had commanded, all that Moses well, this, commanded, and moved on and saved us, you know, 
uh, ten verses, and why didn't you do that? And uh, and that and I don't have an answer for that. Meaning, well, it uh, seems like it seems like it was saying this is what you will do, and then here it's right. saying this is what they did do. Right. Is but why was that so bad, But it's the same. It's the same amount of detail. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Right. So, could, and there are and there are passages in the in the Bible in the you know where where someone is given a very detailed commandment, and then it will say. And he did according to all that God commanded him. And it doesn't repeat the, the thing in detail. And, and that's actually really interesting. And we actually see three patterns. This, this is significant, I think. We see three patterns. One is this pattern where the commandment's given in detail and the, and the execution of the commandment is given in detail. Second pattern is where the commandment is given in detail and the execution is stated very concisely. And he did mm-hmm. it. The third one, which is the, maybe the most interesting to me, is that sometimes... The uh, the the giving of the commandment is very um, very um, uh, I want to say laconic, but in plain English that means it's it's very very concise and and very uh, even mysterious. And then when they carry out the commandment, then it's given in the great detail. And so that's something to be aware of that we do have those three patterns, and you find all three of those throughout the Hebrew Bible. Mm-hmm. Meaning sometimes you only find out what the details are when they carry it out. When the commandment's actually given, you just get this, you know, kind of like a, a vague statement. God commanded him concerning, you know, such and such. And then when he actually carries it out, it's like, wow, all this detail. I didn't know that. Um, and so we have all those three patterns. And I don't know that there's a reason. Um, you know, maybe there's some secret hidden meaning that uh, Keith can help us come up with. And then if we pay him enough money, well, he'll give us that secret. Because he's the only <laughs> no, no, no. Well, the only but, thing I would but, say, <laughs> I, no, I want to say something about this that I think is really, really interesting is that um, – and this this is simply a very casual thought, and I just want want you all to think about this. Mm-hmm. So, what's the difference between uh, what happens uh, in the verses thirty, uh, the the verse the chapters that we're in now, and uh, the same discussion about this before? What would be the biggest event that took place between these two chapters? Well, that'd be the golden calf, I suppose. Exactly. As so we have the golden calf, and then they have another very important thing that happens or, in between. Or God is, revealing himself, his attributes. That was also in Exodus 34. Ex- kind of exactly. Yeah. And the new stone tablets. So, you know, one of the things that I, when I was reading this, I keep thinking, one of the, one of the most really wonderful concepts that, uh, that Nehemiah and I talked about some years ago, and please, please bear with me on going back and forth regarding, um, sure, please. you know, the historical aspect of this. But for me, as a person who's coming to this in, in a new and fresh way, one of the things that was very, very interesting for me was to thinking of this, the concept of being that person who comes and hears this read. Not that I'm sitting and reading verse by verse and I've got Jono there that's going to help me slow down and Nehemiah that's going to explain it to me and Keith that's going to give some crazy Methodist interpretation. I'm just simply coming as an ancient Israelite and I'm listening to this being read. So the overall picture I get as I'm coming and listening to this being read is here is what God initially did. Here's what he spoke. Here's what he did. And Moses went up to go out and get this information. And while he did this, the people fell into a great sin. And now this great sin gives us, we interrupt this program for sin. The sin comes in, it's the golden calf. Okay, we got to do it again. So he goes back up to the mountain. <laughs> and he goes back up to the mountain and he does this. And this time he's got to spend, he's spending the time. He comes down, he's got the radiant face. Now we're going to be able to see it even more clear because now we're not dealing with the golden calves. Mm-hmm. It's, like, it's, like, it's like in the big picture of it, it, it doesn't seem so overwhelming. It's like, here's what happened. You guys messed it up. Here's what happened. And when I think about my kids, I think, okay, I told you this the first time. Hey, when you go to the store, do X thing. You didn't do that? Okay, now when you go to the store, you're going to turn to the right. And let me be sure you understand. You know, it's, it's almost like mm-hmm. there, it's like detail becomes even more clear because we've got a further revelation, more information, and, and something that's mm-hmm. happened in between. So that's just my little sure. simple and actually, in in that though, Keith, um, it it does make me wonder that they they the reason why they fell into sin, or one of the reasons why they fell into sin, is because Aaron said to them, "Okay, so break off your uh, your rings, your gold, give me the gold, turn into a golden calf," and uh, and I think it says, correct me if I'm wrong, but after that they they wore no ornaments uh, to show how sorry they were. And then, and okay. it's interesting that uh, Yehovah says, "Have a free will offering if you give your 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 gold, your jewelry." Uh, silver, whatever, and they went, oh, yeah, well, let's get rid of this stuff because it really got us into trouble the first time here. Here it is. I feel bad about it. Here it all is. We want to, want to give it to you. Do you think possibly that might have been a reason why yeah, it was so, so readily given? I'm so glad given? we're doing this. I'm so glad we're doing this. I, I got to spend another card because as you're talking about it, you know, I just think about this. So think, so think of this. Okay, so Aaron says, give me your gold for the false image. Mm-hmm. 
Yehovah says, bring your gold for this work. And, mm-hmm. and you know, Aaron didn't tell the people then, stop giving. You know, in other words, right. it, 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 it's like, it's like, okay, so they gave him what he needed to do that. But when it was time to do the real work, it wasn't a matter of what, what they needed to, to, to give. They brought it. They were stirred to give it. They were, mm-hmm. and, and there was more than they needed for the good things, for the right thing, for the biblical thing, for the God mm-hmm. thing. And then for the man-made uh, attempts, you know, this is why I think that there are a lot of gold image. I said it this weekend in Florida. Uh, little, well, we'll have you guys hear this some some weekends again. Is that 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 you know the images that are that are raised up and told. Here's what you've got to do. I mean, there's got to be all kind of manipulations and confusion and and all this nonsense. It's just not God. It's just not mm-hmm. God to do that. So I think when we we know that we we see Him stirring people and we see things happen, you know, we should feel like um that we're in step with him. So that's all I'd have to say. Amen. And we should, mm-hmm. and we should feel that we are in step with him. There's a lot of people out there, just going back to verse 34, and he has put in his heart the ability to teach. There's a lot of people out there teaching mm-hmm. uh, or say that they are teachers, that they're teaching, mm-hmm. and w- w- what they're saying isn't what people are. Yeah, it, it doesn't match. It matches word. It doesn't it match the Torah. Word. It doesn't, that's right. Yeah. It doesn't match yeah. his word. Amen. And, and to add that to, uh, uh, another aspect to that, the word for teach, uh, horot, is from the same root as the word Torah, which really mm-hmm. means teaching or instruction. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and you know, in this case, presumably it's not just to teach Torah, it's to teach these different um, aspects of um, instruct and these different aspects of, you know, working gold and metal and, and you know, and, mm-hmm. and wood and et cetera. And let me say something. Um, but okay, it also so has that connotation as well. Doggone you guys are going to make me say this, so I'm going to say it. <laughs> One of the things that I'm struggling with just at this particular uh, time, and by the time people are listening to this, is that I, I feel so um, I feel so concerned about this whole idea of Torah teacher. I'm, I'm a Torah teacher. Um, you know, I'm going to teach Torah. That's what I do. I'm a Hebrew roots of your faith, and I teach the Torah. And yet, um, not actually opening up the Torah and and taking the time to try to understand it or interact with it its language, its history, its context, I don't know how you can consider yourself a Torah teacher if you're not actually interacting with the Torah, unless you're just mm-hmm. using the Torah as a marketing tool because that's the hot thing or that's the thing that people are interested in or that's the thing mm-hmm. that I can give you the secret with. And that's, that's what is so frustrating to me. I, I, really, I, I really believe that if we're going to open up the Tanakh and, hey, I don't care how much Hebrew Nehemiah knows or how much uh, you know, Methodist, whatever I know, or how much you know Jono, we have to be brought into this opportunity um, with a heart and a spirit and a mind that gives glory to him and to truly want to understand it the way that it was. And we don't have all the answers, but approaching it is interacting with it. And I don't know how you can consider yourself a Torah teacher if you're not interacting with the Torah itself. Amen. The concept of Torah is not good enough. Mm. <laughs> it's, it's not good enough just to deal with the concept. You know, it's a great word right now. You no, know, it's got to be the Torah itself. So mm. anyway. Amen. And so, I mean, when, when, you, when you turn the, back, the question back to me, Keith, how does it feel to be uh, the host of, of Truth To You Radio? I can tell you this, and this is how I've answered it before, I feel like it is entirely my privilege to be that Yehovah would let me be involved in some way. And, and I'll add to that that uh, it is an incredible blessing for me, and I know it is for so many listeners, but, but I'm certainly one of them. It's an incredible blessing for me to be able to discuss Torah in such a Depths, but also in a light-hearted manner, but in such depths with 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 two of the with with, with men that I I very much respect, uh, and I appreciate the knowledge that you guys bring, and and the wisdom that we that we, we see within the word and the discussion that goes on. I just want I just want to take the opportunity to really thank you guys for uh, for what it is you do on the program. It is it is very much appreciated and it's very well, much. I, w- I want to thank you, John, because I don't know if people realize how much time you spend afterwards. Um, uh, editing out half my jokes and uh <laughs> no but but not just the jokes but you know really uh one of the reasons keith and i had talked about doing something like this for years and, and frankly the reason we didn't is that neither of us has the skill to um to really edit something like this and so i, I want to give a, a round of applause everyone <laughs> sitting in their living room and in their cars driving take your hands off the wheel right now and give a round of applause for general clap yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. it really is a big deal I don't think people appreciate how big a deal that is, and you do a masterful job of it, not just of that, of course, but also of, I was actually talking to someone who uh, you had invited on the program, and this person said to me, I, I don't know what to say, and I said, don't worry, Jonah will draw it out of you, that's his amazing mm. skill that he has, so you really do have a skill. Let me say this, job. though, I will be offering uh, for 1995, that was <laughs> on the 
on the editing floor, folks, if there's some of the stuff that Nehemi has said, if you think he's funny now, no, you no, see what just <laughs> no, 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 I'm going to be, uh, 1995, I'm going to be providing it after the uh, Torah portions are over, and I've been keeping all of them, so it's going to be hilarious. <laughs> the, title, the title of the CD will be, you got to edit that out. <laughs> no, it's called X-Boy. Un- <laughs> Baby X. <laughs> Baby X. Baby X in the editing room floor. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, all right. God for the go. process. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Now listen, it goes on. Okay, building the tabernacle, building the ark of the testimony, making the table for the showbread, making the golden lamp stand, the altar of incense, the anointing oil, and the incense, the uh, the altar for burnt offering, the bronze basin, which we were talking about as well, and the court of the tabernacle. There it is in a nutshell. And when, believe me right now, we're not going to go through it all in detail. Is there anything in the Is there anything in here that you want to pull out? Right. So not really. We've already, you know, talked about these things. And, and frankly, it was kind of boring the first time with, you know, <laughs> uh, I mean, let's be honest. It's the, it's the description of a structure that's never going to be built again. So, you know, and, and look, I, I, I try to, you know, I know every word is important, and, but I'll be honest with you, I've you know, read this many, many, many times, and I struggle with it because, you know, it's like those lists of names, you know, what, what, you know and here it's even worse because a list of names, okay, that's our heritage. Well, what's, you know, um, I don't know. So that's why I think a lot of people will look at this and they'll say, okay, well, this is, has a secret meaning, and the reason this is red is it represents the blood of something, and the reason that, you know, that, that's what they'll come up with, and all right, that's their approach, trying to understand the plain meaning. You know, I, like I said, I do struggle with it, but here is what I think is a total pearl. But it's a controversial topic. Can I talk about something very oh, controversial? Please. Maybe the most controversial thing. Ooh. Okay. There's some people out there who um, who are turning to Torah and trying to live by the Torah. And uh, I don't want to be judgmental, but they're just kind of whacked out. And what they're doing is um, they see that Abraham had uh, multiple wives and Jacob had multiple wives and, and uh and Hannah, Hannah, in, in the book of uh, Samuel, she was part of a whole multiple wife situation. And they're going out and they're uh, practicing polygamy. And um, I just think they're insane, frankly. Um, but, uh, but I want to look at the biblical side of it. Forget my own personal beliefs, thinking that they're Meshuggahners. But so, all right. So in this description, I'm going to jump back to Exodus 26. It's repeated here in Exodus 38 or whatever. But I want to go to the original verse because it has a certain wording there that's very significant. And can you read for me, Jono, Exodus chapter six, uh, 26, rather, verse 3. I'm going to ask you to read it, too. So flip to your pages, pull up your computer 26, program, you got to. 26 verse, verse three. 3. Five yeah. curtains shall be coupled with one another. Come and on, preach it! This is, this is, <laughs> right. I am so... so I am yeah, so okay. intrigued where you're going with okay, this. Is so that what what you on right? earth does this have to do with polygamy? <laughs> five curtains! Someone say five! <laughs> five? <laughs> so, okay, so why is this important? Because in Hebrew, when it says coupled with one another, the Hebrew phrase literally says, Isha el achota, which translates as a woman unto her sister. Now, when you read this verse, and why does it say a woman unto her sister? Because the Hebrew word for curtain is feminine. And so five of these curtains are uh, being attached a woman unto her sister. Well, why, why is that important, you ask? Because if we jump over, and, I, and I'm bringing this now because when we get to Leviticus 18, I know we're not going to have time to talk about it because there's so many other things. But if you go to Leviticus uh, 18, verse, um, verse 18, it says, And a woman unto her sister you will not take. Now what does that mean? And now some people have taken this literally and say, well, you're just not allowed to marry um, Rachel and Leah. That's forbidden at, because they're sisters. And by the way, you know, Jacob doing that, that was before the Torah was given. Uh, Abraham married his half-sister, his own half-sister. So mm-hmm. let's not look to Abraham and Jacob for our marital um, model. Um, and a woman unto her sister you shall not take. Now, when it talked about the curtains, obviously the one curtain uh, wasn't the literal sister of the other. It was w- really that means, it's a Hebrew idiom that means one and another one of the same of the same type. And so a woman unto her sister doesn't necessarily mean a literal sister. It means ah. two women. And then it goes on and it says, and this is this is the proof in my opinion. The next word is litzror. Say litzror. Litzror. Litzror means to trouble her or to vex her, to uncover her nakedness uh, with her in her lifetime. So when the first woman is dead, then you can take the second. You can take her sister. Now whether that's a literal sister or not a literal. That's what we're going to discuss right now. But you you want you can take the sister when the first woman's dead, but if it's in her lifetime, you can't. Now, why do I say it's not a literal sister? 
um, for a number of reasons, but the main one is that word to vex, to trouble. The mm-hmm. Hebrew word for a sister wife, and they did have sister wives. You know, they, sure. they, uh, you know Hagar was the sister wife of, um, of, Sarah, of Sarah, and uh, Rachel was literally the sister wife in, in two ways of, uh, of Leah, but then so were Bilhah and Zilpah, the other two wives. They were sister wives of both Leah, even though they weren't biological sisters, they were sister wives. Um, now, the Hebrew word for sister wife is Sarah, and Sarah means a vexer or a troubler. Now, just there, you've got to know this is not something Scripture is recommending. The fact that the biblical Hebrew word for a second wife is a troubler, a vexer, tells you that this is not an ideal situation. And if you look at every example of it in the Tanakh, it's always some extreme situation. Um, uh, usually, I should say, uh, Jacob's is a special situation, I suppose. But with Abraham and with uh, and with Hannah, there were situations where there was barrenness and the other wife was mm-hmm. taken to bear children. Um, sure. Sort of a, a, a surrogate, uh, as we have in modern times. Um but with the level of technology they had back then. So, uh, and I noticed Keith is completely silent. Um. <laughs> because I have no idea how we got to this from what we were Wait, talking about. So I'll tell you what, Keith, Keith event, is furiously scribbling down notes so that he can do... I'm waiting for him to bring okay. the money ball here. What, go ahead. So the money ball here is, the punchline <laughs> is that you could legitimately translate Leviticus 18.18, and I didn't make this up. This is a way that some traditional Jewish commentators, not all, but some have interpreted this. A woman and an, and her sister wife, meaning not her literal sister, but a woman and a sister wife you shall not take to vex her, to trouble her, meaning to be a second wife, to uncover her nakedness upon her during her lifetime. And what that means, according to this interpretation I'm proposing, is that it's actually forbidden to take a second wife that is a vexation, a troubling to the first wife. And the only context in which that was even considered in ancient times, and it still caused trouble, is when there was a woman who was completely buried in a barren and they desperately wanted to have children. And so it was the woman who initiated and said, okay, you know, let's do a whole surrogate situation where you have another, you have a child through this woman that I'm giving you to take. But this whole idea of, you know, you know, I don't like my first wife. I'm going to go take a second wife, which is what some of these um, whacked out people are doing out there who are claiming to be trying to follow Torah. Um, and, and, you know, what they're really doing, frankly, and I'm going to say something really controversial. I won't say it. Okay. Um, no, I'll say it. What, what they're doing is they're looking at other religions um, whose – I won't mention what those religions are. They're not looking at the Tanakh because in the Tanakh, a sister wife is called a trouble or a vexer. It's not something that's recommended, and it's only even considered under those extreme situations. And under normal circumstances, it's completely forbidden there that that is an absolute bombshell keith have you got your sandpaper can you sand it can you smooth this over no i don't want to smooth it over i think it's really powerful i i, I was trying to f- so 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 okay <laughs> so so we're not doing this t- portion anymore <laughs> <laughs> well we bounced off from now now just remind everyone we did <laughs> all right so we jumped from the from the curtains one to another uh which is mentioned in chapter 26 also repeated in chapter 38 is that right nachemia Okay, let me just pass out. <laughs> What's happened to the program? <laughs> Keith, your turn. Is there anything? Do you have a grenade no, you want to throw no, over the rim no, and no, run no, away? No, 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 But really, in this, in this section, it, we're, we're basically repeating. Yep, so. we're basically repeating. So we're going to move on because actually this week, um, the reason why this one's out early is because this is a week with a double Torah portion. There's, there's various reasons for that. But uh, next week, not sorry, no, later this week, we are in... Uh, Exodus chapter 38 verse 1 to 40 verse 38. So that's in a couple of days that one will be out because it's a double portion this week. And uh, so thank you. I think we're done. Thank you, Nehemiah Gordon and Keith Johnson. I want to take the opportunity. Oh, well, I should say that books, DVDs are available on the website. And Truth To You has just started a newsletter. But I just want to remind the listeners if they go to truthtoyou.org, truth number two, letter U, dot org. Uh, you can sign up, register for the newsletter. So again, thank you, Nehemiah Gordon. Keith Johnson, Nehemiah, are you back? <laughs> I, I don't know where he went. I'm telling you, Keith, he threw a grenade into the room and then he ran away. Where can, is can he? you hear me? Oh, now you're there. What Nehemiah, happened? tell me you didn't Wait, do that on purpose. You seriously didn't hear me? I no, couldn't hear anything no, you Nehemiah, were saying throughout that whole you. time. I kept saying there's actually two more points I want to talk about. <laughs> No, can I honestly, listen, 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 I'm going to tell you what I honestly thought happened, and I, I dead serious, and Jonah, you tell me if you felt the same way, that you just got mad or something and hung up the phone. I know, and I keep saying, wait, just two more points, and Jonah's like, okay, and that's all there is, and I'm like, what? No, because we, you, so you couldn't silence, oh, and actually, we, we were trying to fix it, and my heart started beating, because I'm like, 
he's mad or something. <laughs> I'm like, what happened to the guy? No, I, I was interacting with you, and I'm like, oh, no, we didn't hear a word of your interaction. Not a word. Didn't hear any of it. Huh. So then, Honestly, you, well, you the, it, the, the grenade exploded, and it was. It exploded even... on the Meshuggah, and then you and then you left. <laughs> oh, I was here the whole time. <laughs> no, Nehemiah, no one heard a word. I was talking. And, and the funniest thing was, Jonah said, So, Nehemiah, do you have anything to say? Complete no, silence. No, but I said something. No, I no one heard something. a word. No one heard a word. And so we're like, and Jonah's like, Well, thank you very much for two <laughs> you. <laughs> That will you go down in his. Right. I'm taking us. No, I'm taking us off the of the historical documentaries. I'm putting us back into the comedy section. This so is. Can, just... we, can we can we do this, Nehemia? So okay, so okay. I don't know how you're going to edit this. Okay, so Nehemia, when you decide, you said let's go to Exodus 26 and talk about the coupling. What was the Exodus 26 issue? Hmm. Was the Exodus 26 oh, so issue? Exodus. I don't know if it was, uh, and I can find you the verse in a second. Hold on okay. here. It's um. So that that exact thing from Exodus 26, verse 3, I believe, is mm-hmm. repeated in Exodus 36, verse 10. Um, ah. And there it uses actually a different expression. It says, and he coupled the five curtains one to another. And there the expression is echat el echat, one to one. Well, the expression, the figure of speech in Exodus 26, 3 is isha el achota, a woman to her sister. Okay. Well, no one in the right mind would think it literally means a sister. Obviously, it means one to another. So that's mm-hmm. the, the figure of speech, the expression that appears in other places in the Bible as well. Um, mm-hmm. And so so I wanted to talk about that when we did Exodus 26, but we went on for two hours. And so I said, OK, we'll do it when we when we when they actually, you know, that's mm-hmm. the commandment when it's carried out. You know, that will okay. be the opportunity to then talk about that. So, OK, awesome. Awesome. There's the, a few interesting little points that I just want to really, really quickly. So verse 20 of Exodus 36 um, talks about the material, and this has been mentioned before, but um, so the material is the acacia wood. And uh, one of the things you'll see when you come to southern Israel and go around the Negev or in the Sinai Desert in Egypt um, is is that there are acacia trees all over the place, and they're really kind of tiny, wimpy trees. And that explains why the, the, the one of the reasons why I think the tabernacle was modular, it was made of these planks these uh, that were like, you know, attached um, and actually, if you look in verse 24, they were basically attached very similar to the, in the way that Lego works. Um, and I don't know how it's translated in, in verse 24, but the way it says it in Hebrew is there are two prongs, and you have these clasps that could t- connect the two prongs on each plank. And so basically, it's connecting kind of like Lego. Um, and the reason for that is that acacia trees are not very large. Also, I guess it makes it portable. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to mention. The other one um, is in uh, verse 33. Can you read verse 33 for us, uh, Jonah? Verse 33 says, and he made the middle bar to pass through the boards from one end to the other. Right. Okay. So the way the rabbis interpret this is that this was a great miracle, because when it says from one end to the other, they say, well, you know, the the um, the tabernacle was shaped like a chet, or like in English, a U, sort of like a U, and mm-hmm. so it must have gone one to the other means literally it went through the middle of the boards, down one side, around the corner, and then out around the other corner, and then out the other end. And so they say that was the, one of the great miracles of the tabernacle. Um, I think. Well, hang on, hang literally... on. Wait a minute. Hang on, hang on. <laughs> Let yeah. me just picture this in my head. And he made yeah. the middle bar to pass through the boards from one end to the other. So are they suggesting that the board sort of made a U turn and went? Uh, yeah. Like you put one. Really. And that was a okay. miracle because it was wood co- coated over with what is it, gold? So hmm. that can't happen naturally. And I, and I think that that's probably not what it means. I think what it simply means is that there was a hole in the middle of the boards. And it simply on each side went through. Um, <laughs> okay. So, but anyway, oh. so that's one little interesting point. And then the other one, which may not be a quick thing, but can we do this anyway? Sure, um, please. So, okay. So one of the really big things you'll hear people talking about is the Paleo Hebrew, the Paleo Hebrew. Mm-hmm. And uh, the Paleo Hebrew is the original Hebrew script. Uh, as far as we know, it's possible that there was some other script before that. But of what we know... The Paleo Hebrew seems to be the original Hebrew script. It certainly predates the current script we use, which is the, uh, called the Assyrian script. Mm-hmm. It was originally used to uh, write Aramaic. Um, and, of course, Aramaic is this bastardized form of Hebrew that was created at the Tower of Babylon. So, so mm-hmm. really, I mean, the Aramaic, if you think about it, is confused Hebrew. It's Babel Hebrew. Sure. Um, so, and, and that's, unfortunately, the script that we use today. But the original Paleo Hebrew script uh, is preserved in some ancient... Uh, inscriptions is actually some of the earliest Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, for example, the Paleo Leviticus scroll written in the Paleo Hebrew script. And um, so uh, 
the rabbis around the third or fourth century uh, CE were having a discussion trying to figure out what was the original script. Was it Paleo-Hebrew or our current Assyrian script, the Aramaic script? And they didn't know the answer because they didn't know what the Paleo-Hebrew script looked like anymore. They just knew there had been a thing like that in the past. And they came to the conclusion based on chapter Exodus chapter uh, 38, verse 10, that the Assyrian script was the original Hebrew script, not the Paleo-Hebrew. Um, and the reason they came to that conclusion is it talks about the pillars and it talks about the hooks of the pillars. And they quote this verse. And the word Hebrew word for hook is vav. Now, vav is the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Yes. And they looked at our, they looked at the, the later Hebrew vav, the one that we use today, and they said, well, that kind of looks like a hook. And so the original Hebrew script has to be the Assyrian script, not the Paleo-Hebrew, which <laughs> just on the surface wow. sounds ridiculous. Um, wow. There's a really interesting story where a rabbi named Nachmanides was involved in this disputation in the year 1263. He was forced to mm -hmm. debate with this uh, Jewish convert to Christianity, Pablo Cristiani. Pablo Christian, and yeah. when, when he won, the debate, and there's actually a great video you can get, uh, they have it on Amazon. Actually, you can see it on YouTube, but if you want a good quality, go to Amazon. And uh, it's called The Disputation, which tells this story. Well, at the end of the mm -hmm. story, uh, Nachmanides wins the disputation, and he's, and, and he's forced to flee from Spain uh, to save his life. Um, so he won the disputation, but he basically lost because he, you know, he had to leave the, the land where he was born. And so he decides he's going to go to the land of Israel and he arrives in Akko, uh, which is the ma major court, uh, excuse me, major port on the, on the coast of Israel. Uh, and, um, or it was back then now, you know, it only has small fishing boats, but back then that was, you know, the size of the boats. And so he arrives at Akko and he finds an ancient Hebrew coin with paleo Hebrew writing on it. And he writes, and he, when he's in Israel, he writes a commentary on the Torah. And he says in his commentary on the Torah, he says, when I got to Akko and saw that coin, I realized our, our sages in the Talmud were wrong, that they were wrong about the, about the Paleo-Hebrew because he could see a Paleo-Hebrew vav on his, the ancient coin, and it looked like a hook. And from that, he concluded that the Assyrian script was not the original script. I mean, today we know that for a fact, but I think it's so interesting of how you know, this rabbi arrives in Israel and finds an ancient coin, and based on that, he realizes that, yeah, our sages were wrong, and the Paleo-Hebrew must be the original script, not the mm. script that we mm -hmm. even call the, you know, the Assyrian, like it's called Assyrian, so obviously it's not uh, ancient mm -hmm. Hebrew. Um, and that's the interesting thing. The ancient Paleo-Hebrew vav is actually shaped like a hook. And actually, and, and when you look at the Paleo-Hebrew vav and look at verse 10, you're like, oh, that's what was on the top of the pillar, that sort of hooked shape thing. So that's pretty cool. There it is. Story. That is awesome. That is it's awesome. Yeah. Okay, now we feel better. Ladies and gentlemen, you might not realize, but uh, we thought that Nehemiah <laughs> had left the farm, and he was talking, and we couldn't hear him. And we so couldn't. now he's talking, and we can hear him, and we're now very appreciative of the fact that he's still with us on the program. <laughs> very glad to have you back, Nehemiah. <laughs> we thought daughter. we lost him. <laughs> so before no, that was we a close technology up. challenge. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> before we oh, close up for the second time. Keith, is there anything else you want to pull out of this, uh, out of the Torah portion? No, I would just like to say that this has been the, one of the most interesting uh, Torah portions for me, and uh, yes. I look forward to uh, ending it quickly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let it be known. We did try initially to be, we tried very hard not to be funny, so yes. my apologies to everyone. Um, no, we can't help it. It's, it's our, you know, we're just funny, you know, funny guys. Yeah. We're funny guys. Okay. All right. <laughs> Man, once again, later this week, Nehemiah, is that right? Pekudi? Pekudi. What? Pekudi? Pekudi. There it is, Exodus 38, verse 1. Uh, a, to pickle, 40, a, pickle verse... And an, a pickle and an onion. Okay. The... What? What? <laughs> verse 38. Oh, and until then, dear listeners, oh, <laughs> be blessed and be set. This is one of the... Oh, my goodness. Be blessed. Be set apart by the truth of our Father's word. Amen? Amen. 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 Shalom. I think that it brings me to a story. I want to tell you the story, Jono, because here's what's funny about Nehemiah, okay? So I learned this a long time ago. So it, so we go to South Africa. <laughs> and, uh, and so Nehemiah cannot blow a shofar. It's a fact he can't blow a shofar. Everyone knows he can't blow a shofar. So we're in a stinking airport, and he sees the Zeus. The, 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 <laughs> Bubuzela. Bubuzela. Ah, yeah. Now, here's the point. No, but, but this is a particular one called a kuduzella, which looks exactly like Keith's chauffeur, but it's made of yellow plastic. <laughs> it's made of yellow plastic. It's, it's, it's what they put in, the, in the, when, they're, when they're at the, when they're, when they're watching the soccer games. 
So he right. buys one. I, he's like, what do you think if I buy this? I said, no, I mean, I don't Still buy that. It. He says, what do you mean? I want to buy it. I can blow this thing. We go to this <laughs> little small community where they believe that if you blow this particular sound, you're calling forth the demons. Okay? Oh. <laughs> No, no, listen, don't, no, 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 listen no, to me. Okay? About no, and they're dead serious. Oh, so they tell, no. they tell Nehemia, they said, so Nehemia, we're just so, you can't blow the sound of that because you're yeah. calling. So what does Nehemia do? He blows it. Okay, so listen. <laughs> of course I blows it. No, listen, no, listen. So when you get on the radio and say this, he's like, are they challenging me? Okay, they have their money back. Oh, so, he, so he took the There's letter no serious. He's like, I'm going to defy Jono. And then he left the program. Okay. <laughs> Jono. He no, left Jono. It was, it was really Jono, funny. I was talking the whole time. That's the oh, weird thing. Is. Nehemia, listen to what Jono does. He says, so Nehemia, do you have anything else to say? Okay, Nehemia's gone. Keith, uh, how about you? No. Let's end the program. <laughs> We thought we'd lost you for the rest of the year. <laughs> <laughs> so then when you get when you get back on the um, radio, you go, oh guys, I got two more points. <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna go down in history.